Well, hello and welcome. My name is M. Dressler, and I'm delighted to be with you for this talk entitled I See You So Close on Ghosts, Empathy, and Imagination. Before we begin, I just want to say I'm also delighted to be part of ReaderCon uh, this year. Uh, this is my first um, chance to participate in this event, and I just want to give a shout out and warm thanks to all the good folks at Reader, ReaderCon, um, especially Shell. Thank you so much for your patience and assistance. And thank you to all of you uh, for being part of this wonderful speculative uh, occasion. What we're going to be doing um, is I'll be chatting for about 30 minutes, a combination of lecture and reading slash performance, and then we'll throw things open to the live Q&A, which is for me uh, the moment when these um, events really spark. And so I'm very excited and looking forward to hearing and to listening to your voices as well. So we are going to talk about ghosts, empathy, compassion, which if you're familiar with Gothic literature, with ghost stories, or even if you aren't that familiar, um, might not be the first words uh, that come to mind. Um, quite often, as you're probably aware if you read Gothic lit, um, and particularly if you read, if you have read some older Gothic fiction, ghosts are figured, of course, as that which we should fear. We come to the text primed, as it were, to be fearful. And the ghosts within the narrative are figured as dangers, as dangerous, um, and, and problems and dangers that need to be neutralized. This is true if they are actually dangerous um, or malevolent, right? Or if they're just dangerous in the sense that they are inopportune, risky, and unwelcome. Um, they tend to be problems that need to be solved. Um, at the very least, um, they are wanting, needy figures, and it is often the task of those within the framework of the text, usually the living, to figure out what it is, what they, what they want or need. And then once that is divined, um, then the ghosts are laid to rest and we don't have to think about them anymore. Um, and that holds true whether or not the ghost is, is benign or evil. The goal is always, the implied goal in much traditional Gothic fiction is always that by the end of the story, we won't feel the ghosts anymore. We won't feel the haunting. And in some narratives, of course, um, the ghost is not laid to rest by the end. But nevertheless, the implied right, resolution is that they should have been. And if they aren't, um, then a feeling of failure kind of hangs over the narrative, or at least a feeling of dread or dismay or confusion. Because again, the implied narrative arc is that by the time we get to the end of a ghost story, we should no longer have to feel them anymore. Let's just hover over that. For a minute, this idea that the goal is not to feel another human being anymore. By the end of a narrative, not to have to think about them, sense them anymore, not feel another human being anymore. If you just put it that way, it sounds rather strange, doesn't it? It sounds like um, training in marginalization or an exercise in othering, right? Imagine again, when we come to Gothic literature, a ghost story, we, there is an entity, a being, a human being that has come out of the shadows of the margin or the darkness. And the task quite often, again, is to put them back where they came, put them back where they came from, put them back into the shadows. Because the dead <clears throat> don't really have a place among the living, particularly in Western literature. The dead don't have a place among the living. There is a border, a defined boundary between life and death, and it should not be crossed. Even if a human soul or human souls is clamoring at that border for attention, is wanting to be attended to, the general idea is that we should be fearful of that, right? We should be afraid and we should seek to somehow contain that fear within the framework of the narrative, box it in the book or cage it in some way um, so that we don't have to feel that fear anymore and so that the border not, will not really be crossed. The borderline, the boundary will be maintained. Let me say that again. See if you can hear it. 
human soul or souls at a border, asking for our attention. The impulse, or what we learn, is that we should be afraid of that. We should cage or contain it, and cage and contain that fear, and put it aside, and not let that border be crossed, and not think about those souls anymore. If you've been following recent political history, some of that might resonate with you. What if instead of practicing that kind of fear and othering and disengagement, we use ghosts or ghost stories, not as a form of practice in othering, but as sites of wildly imaginative compassion. What if we explored haunting as a form of listening, not just on the part of those being haunted, right? we have to listen to the haunt, but the haunt itself also being an active listener. What if we explored and used the Gothic as a way to think about how hard listening, really listening is? Even now, your thoughts, your concentration, your attention is probably kind of flitting in and out of how hard it is to really listen. And we use the Gothic to think about how hard it is to really see each other. These questions are fascinating to me. And so you can probably see then why I've become tremendously interested in writing novels where the ghost is the narrator. The ghost is the central force, but is also the narrator. So that we must enter the story from a kind of position of empathy. We enter that way. We're invited to walk in the ghost shoes, particularly if the narrative is in first person. We are encouraged, invited, or perhaps in some ways forced to listen to the ghost. And not only that, to listen as a ghost. As she tells us about her life, her afterlife, and the specific dilemmas of being a ghost. I learned a lot of this through a character named Emma Rose Finnis who came to me oh, about seven years ago. And I'll tell you by way of background a little bit about her and how I discovered her. Um, I was traveling uh, in Northern California with my husband along beautiful Highway 1. He was driving and I was getting to be the writer sort of zoned out in the passenger seat. And if you're familiar with Highway 1, <clears throat> it's, it's a glorious road, very twisting and turning, hugging along the edge of the coast. Uh, it is hypnotic, puts you in this rather rhythmic state, and it's physically glorious. On the one side, you have the Pacific Ocean. It's spray and crags and cliffs and rocks and foam and mist hurtling upward. On the other side and all around, you have the lush, green vegetation, of the redwood forests of that part of the world, flowers, small quaint villages passing by. It's incredibly beautiful. And as we're driving along, I turn to my husband and I say quite, quite glibly, really off the cuff, do you know, it's so beautiful here. Even if you died, you wouldn't want to leave. And the minute I said that, oh, Emma Rose Finnis appeared in front of me. Now, I didn't know that that was her name at that point. I just saw her. I saw from her hairstyle, her high-necked blouse, her nipped waist, her skirt, her laced boots, that she was not of this time. She appeared to be from the early 1900s. Um, as I looked at her and I tried to see her more clearly, um, she seemed to be strong to me. She had a strong neck, shoulders, strong hands. Something about her suggested the working person, the working class. And indeed, I would later find out that she was in her life a domestic servant, a servant in a large, wealthy household. I kept looking at her and something about her, her posture and her coloring suggested the immigrant, that combination of strength and yet also reticence. Um, and indeed, I would come to find out that she was an immigrant from Ireland. And the longer I looked at her, the more I began to think that I heard her voice and I heard what ended up being the last line of her first book. But I knew that I was going to have to pay very, very close attention to figure out who this ghost was, really see her and 
couldn't understand why she had shown up and what it was she was trying to tell me and teach me. One of the things I've learned from Emma Rose Finnis is this, that if you are a ghost, as long as you stay invisible, silent, and unseen, you'll be allowed to persist. You can survive in the afterlife. The problem for Emma is that as a domestic servant in her life, she was already silent, unseen, and relegated to the margins. And in her death now, she is being expected to do the same thing in order to continue. Her dilemma, vis-a-vis -vis being seen or not seen, understood or not understood, is that if she dares to show herself in the fullness of her humanity, if she dares to show her passion, her anger, her love, her hate, her hopes, her dreams, if she dares to show herself as human, she will be put down by a ghost hunter who has arrived on the scene specifically for that purpose. Let me say that again. If you dare to demand to be seen as human, that is the moment when you are at most risk. Think about that because that might resonate for some of us in our lives or in the lives of our loved ones as well. Those of us who, who so desperately want to demand to be seen as fully human, and yet we are not. And when we ask to be seen, we put ourselves in danger or at risk. To make some of this come to life, I think I'll read a little bit from um, The Last to See Me, which is um, the first book in a series of novels I'm writing um, from the perspective of a ghost, Emma Rose Finnis, um, called The Last Ghost Series. The Last to See Me is um, the first book in this series, and it's our first opportunity to hear Emma Rose Finnis's voice. Again, the voice of a working class servant girl, immigrant, relegated to the shadows in her life, forced to stay in the shadows in her death as a ghost hunter arrives on the scene to eradicate her. This is a scene in which we are in the haunted house that Emma has been uh, a specter in for a hundred years and more. The ghost hunter's name is Philip Pratt. He is a practiced practitioner and uh, he is there to do his job with the aid of a realtor named Ellen DeWight, uh, who is in charge of selling the house and therefore making sure that it is clean before it is sold. At the beginning of this scene, um, Philip Pratt, the hunter, by the way, just think about that nomenclature, right? Uh, the idea of the ghost hunter, very common parlance uh, in nowadays in, in the Gothic tradition. With all that that implies, the hunter is someone who chases quarry or prey, not something that is fully human and worthy of dignity, but rather something to be chased down, um, to be um, eradicated and perhaps even consumed. The hunter, Philip Pratt, is explaining to Ellen Dwight, the realtor, um, what it is that he is doing in the house. Um, and Emma Rose Venice is in the shadows and can hear all of this. First, we'll hear the voices of the living and then we'll hear the voice of the dead. I need, Philip Pratt says, to see what kind of anger has been here in the house. What kind of impulse? What do you mean? The realtor asks. He shakes his head and looks down at the cove. It's not a living anger, he says. It's not the kind of anger you or I would feel, at least that he doesn't finish his sentence. Imagine, he shifts and says instead, still gazing at the spray bursting on the rocks below, a wave that has no outlet, like those waves out there hitting on the beach again and again and again. Unsettled souls are like that, trapped. They don't release emotion the way that we do. If they did, we would have to say they were still living. We can try to imagine what they're feeling. You can hear him there evoking the idea of imagination, but turning it to a different purpose. We can try to imagine what they're feeling, but we really can't do it because they are what they are, and we are what we are. Their charge isn't life. The charge is all that's left of them. And now we hear Emma's voice from the shadows. This is the terrible part. This, the terrible 
terrible pest. I have to keep still around talk like this, unmoved, stay cold and unfeeling behind the mask, this veil of light. I have to be careful not to be angry or allow myself to feel any emotion at all, feel the very thing he says I cannot feel. Because if I do, if I show for one minute that I'm human, then in the next moment, I won't be allowed to be. The charge, that's what they call our lasting. That's all they think we are, a bit of static left in the linen, a spark when you rub your gloves together in the cold. So I make myself go as cold as ice. I turn myself into the nothing he believes I am. I push all my anger and love and hate and hope deep, deep down inside me. And only when I've done it, do I glide and stand even closer to both of them, right by their sides, but closest of all to Ellen DeWight, to her ear, so close that any heat, any hint of feeling that might escape my soul, heal mistake or hers. Oh, how I've learned how to manage moments such as this, haven't I? Still, dead, be still, be dead. I've learned things that you, Mr. Pratt, would never dream of, but also things the living know very well how to do, how to act as though you don't care about the life that you live, how to lie and seem to be one thing while being another. I've gone to school on you, the living, all these years, all this long century, on the young and old and everything in between. I've sat in your classrooms and I've studied your books and I've touched your slates and screens and glowing tablets and I've listened at your keyholes and to your telephones and I've learned more than any living soul will ever know. Because I've learned the one thing that people give away when you think no one is there, when you think no one is watching, that you are frightened beyond belief of that place you would happily send others to. It's tricky um, when you're writing a story like this um, to keep one sense of empathy expansive and open. Because you, as you might be able to hear from that scene, it would have been really easy for me as a novelist beginning this series um, to make Emma Finnis um, a heroine, right? And direct all the reader's empathy toward her and turn Philip Pratt into a pure villain, um, which might be satisfying on some level because I don't think we necessarily are meant to like Philip Pratt. But also in my view, doesn't do anything to enlarge the experience or practice of empathy within the framework of the Gothic. One of the reasons that I love writing ghost stories is that they're not only about borders being crossed or worlds colliding. Um, they're about worldviews colliding. And uh, that's very much the case um, in, in, this, in this narrative because we have the worldview of Philip Pratt um, who genuinely believes that he's doing good on the planet. He absolutely believes that what he's doing has value and is valid. He believes that he's bringing peace to both the living and the dead. He's giving the dead rest and he's giving the living freedom from haunting. He believes in the worthiness of what he's doing. And Emma Rose Finnis, of course, absolutely genuinely believes the exact opposite, that she does not want peace. She's not interested in rest. She wants to be awake, alert, and alive, right? And has absolute faith in her right to inhabit the house and to take up space in the world. By the time we get to the second book in the series, which is called um, I see you so close. This idea of, of right that Emma has has crystallized into uh, around a single phrase that begins the book, and it's this. Um, Let no one tell you what form you can take. Let no one tell you what form you can take. Let no one limit your imagination about what it is that you should look like or what you should be. And I've been struck as I've gone deeper and deeper into the realm of the contemporary Gothic and what it can do by how it means not only that we can be as readers, writers, consumers of Gothic literature, more imaginative, more expansive in the ways that we read and use these texts, 
um, but that we can also honor the tremendous imaginative capacity of the ghost herself. Now, what do I mean by that? You might think that, that what I mean is that, um, well, to, to continue a series like this, it's going to be a series of books, um, I would have to have a very imaginative ghost just to keep things interesting, that Emma Rose Finnis is going to have to be very imaginative and inventive um, in order to um, simply sustain the series and, and make it continue to be interesting and valuable to readers. And I suppose there's truth to that, but that's not really what I mean. I really mean something more, something in addition to that. What I mean is that texts like this might be an opportunity to, for us to think about and for a ghost to share with us ideas about the challenges of empathy from the margin, not from the easy place, right? But from the margins, from the difficulties, from the shadows. I'm interested in thinking about how difficult it must be for a ghost to retain her empathy, right? And her compassion from the other side. How far does her willingness go, right? Her willingness to imagine and empathize with the living, given where she is. And does she even need to, you know? Um, should she always, is she required to be more empathetic toward the living than they are toward her? Because if she is, isn't she then just replicating the position of so many people, so many marginalized communities that we know that tend to already have to do more work than those who are not marginalized? In other words, is it really the job of the people standing in the darkness to do all the emotional labor and empathy, right? Much more so than those already standing in the light. And yet the truth is that it's often those of us who live in the shadows. Um, by the way, I'm an immigrant in mixed race. It's often the work of those of us who live in the shadows or the result perhaps of living in those spaces that makes us in some ways potentially more empathetic. That's a quandary. How do you balance that? The idea that one wants empathy and wants to experience empathy, but how does one do that? from a position of injustice or marginalization without taking upon more burden on the self. What I'm gonna do now is actually read a longer excerpt from I See You So Close, um, so that you can start to hear me within the framework of my own writing, um, grappling with some of these questions and concerns. As I read this, and it'll be the first chapter in the book, you'll hear me move through a lot of what we've already been talking about. So you'll hear the chapter start out very deliberately and specifically with the image or the feeling of the malevolent, dangerous ghost. And then start to move away from that, away from the idea of the malevolent spirit toward the language of imagination, of adaptation, of insisting on or asserting a new form or new ways of thinking. While at the same time, though, still being. This is Emma Rose Finnis I'm talking about, still being flawed and human, not a paragon, right? Not perfect, but still a work in progress. Which if you think about it, is not um, the way that we tend to envisage ghosts as works in progress. We tend, some of us, very much like Philip Pratt, perhaps, to see them as static entities, problems that need to be solved. What if, just like us, they are works in progress. I invite you to sit back now and relax for a bit. I'm going to read for a little while, and then we'll throw things open to the live Q&A, which I'm so looking forward to. This is um, from the first chapter of uh, I See You So Close. So what do you do for a living, hon? For a living? Such a curious question. The woman beside me driving the car means what work is it that I do to keep body and soul together, as they say. I don't know how to answer that. When you're dead, you don't work in the usual way. My job is to keep always one step ahead of the ghost hunters. Of course, the woman sitting next to me, driving, doesn't know that. She picked me up by the side of this mountain road, where I'd raised my thumb to her because I look as alive as anyone, as alive as she does in her downy white jacket. If you look a certain way, you're seen as no threat. 
She pulled the car over and leaned across to open the door, and by her face I saw she'd even taken pity on me. Because this body I wear, with its thin blue coat, makes me look small and weak, under a haircut bobbed blunt and short, like a child's. She likely thought, I needn't be afraid of this girl standing at the edge of the woods. I might even help her. And it's true that if you, the living, are kind to me and treat me well, you'll have no reason to fear me. But if instead you decide a young woman, standing pale and cold and all alone and small and needing a lift, is someone to take advantage of, well, you're going to run into a bit of trouble. The last driver who stopped for me, a grubby, grabby man, who thought me an easy mark, I left him making better acquaintance with the bottom of the lake his hands pounding against the window glass. Such beautiful lakes and trees they have here, so high up in the mountains, much like we had on the coast. The leaves and the pine boughs quiver and quake as the sun drops its work for the day. Makes me feel right at home. I'm in housekeeping, I answer the pleasant woman beside me. I tidy and clean things. Hard work, she asks, nodding and turning her wheel on the twisting road. Sometimes. Sometimes not. I'm an office manager, she tells me. Is that good work? Used to be. Not so much anymore. They've got me doing the jobs of two younger assistants who left, plus my own job. You know, what can you do? Things change. They do. I used to be an ordinary ghost, a spirit tied to a place, a haunt. Now I have this body, this flesh to call my own and to travel and touch the world with. Imagine. What that's like, how it might feel after being invisible, erased, holding on only with your will for a hundred years and more, to at last find you have a way again to fill space. Though to be sure when I wear this body, I can't flit or fly as easily as my ghostly self can. I can feel the scrape though of this veined armrest behind me, the cloth of the seat at the back of my head, the folded collar of this coat but I feel the weight of this skin too, and the pressure of the one who died so that I could take it. She was young and bright and didn't deserve to die any more than I did. All you can do is take a break from life now and then, my new unknowing friend goes on. So me and some of my girlfriends were taking off work and meeting in Reno, gonna let off some steam. Do you like to gamble? Well, I took a chance and stole a body to escape a hunter, so I'd say I do. Yeah. Come with me the whole way, she says, nodding, certainly, if you want to, no trouble. She's one of a kind living, though she seems suddenly tired, clutching the wheel. She sighs and says after a moment, I don't mean to be pushy, though. Hun. Everyone's got their own way of doing things, I, I know that. I thank her and tell her that at the moment I'm looking for something peaceful and out of the way. God, I hear that, she laughs a little. I need that sometimes too. Just want to cut myself off from everything. Check out, lie low. You're in the right stretch of the Sierra Nevada for some good downtime. There's some pretty little towns hidden up here. Just let me know where you want to jump out, Miss. I I'm sorry, is it okay for me to ask your name? I don't say. I'm Emma Rose Finnis. Irish born and Irish stubborn, raised to be staunch in the face of wounds. I don't tell her I came into the world in 1896 and died in 1915, drowned unfairly against cold, black rocked shoals. Nor that I haunted a mansion beside the sea for more than a hundred years until a hunter came along and thought he was strong enough to put me down. He wasn't. My name is Rose, I say, and you're Sheila. That's right, how did you know? Your baggage in the back seat. Oh, you read that tiny tag? You must have 20-20 vision. Yes, these eyes and ears are as keen and quick as mine once were. I might draw no real breath, but this nose, it scents the powder clinging to the soft, sagging cheek beside me and the weary sweat at her heavy neck. I might have no heartbeat, yet my soul still pounds in furious answer to what's right and what's wrong and knows light and dark which is how I know this woman laughing beside me is only laughing on the outside, and that under the powder and the hands rubbed with lotion to make them feel softer, she's hard 
She's worn. She's a servant in someone else's mansion, just as I once was. It can make you feel beaten down. I say, I noticed your luggage because I like to get away too. Where'd you come from, Rose? The ocean. Oh, nice. I've always wanted to live on the coast, hot down in the valley where I'm from. I could use more fog and rain and mist in my life. You come from the north coast or the south? Oh, the north. Do you mind the cold? No, I'm used to it. Also, it helps disguise me. If the temperature is freezing and someone living accidentally brushes against my skin and feels how icy I am, then they aren't startled and I'm not given away. There's a risk I face taking on this body so that I can take in the world. Someone might touch me and wonder. Even I wonder at it, how my icy soul lifted and keeps this body fresh. It's because I willed it, I think, when I saw this flesh fall, remembering all my anger at being felled myself. My new friend Sheila says, I guess you know, Rose, it gets pretty brisk up here this time of year. Ever been this high before? There's no snow yet, but it'll come later than it used to. When I was a kid, we used to drive this pass, and by now everything would already be blanketed. But nothing's like it was anymore, anywhere. I tell myself it's still pretty though. It is. The aspen trees, the higher we've climbed, have soaked in the distant gold of the setting sun, lighting up the dark places between the towering pines. Stony peaks shrug all around in deep grays and blues, half skirted with boulders and flounces of deadfall. When I was a little girl growing up along the seashore, I imagined such mountains rising from the long valley. At school, we studied a map on the wall to learn about the great ranges of California. The Sierra were so high, our teacher excitedly told us that droves of pioneers died trying to cross them. She was a dramatic one, Miss Camber. The great Sierra Nevada in winter could be so deep in bitter snow, she said, that even the tallest man would be buried by it. She'd paced and shivered and clasped her arms as she moaned. A mountain blizzard, why, it could be so cruel, it could take your hands and feet and even your eyes. I'd raise my hand and stood beside my desk, politely, as children, especially poor children, are supposed to do. I asked her, how can snow take your hands and feet and even your eyes? She'd flashed an impatient look at me and said, of course, it froze and rotted your flesh, all of it, and the cold, it was terrible, like all the pangs of hell. But miss, is hell a fire then, or ice? You will sit down, Emma Finnis, for asking such a foolish question. You should know there is earthly pain and there's the pain of damnation. And of course they are different, as I do know. Yet it seemed to me that all pain must be the same, or else how could you recognize it from one place to the next? I was sent to the corner for that little remark. And you stay there, foolish girl, and count in silence to 500. You won't move until I say you may. Well, it was good practice, it turned out, for being gay. My parents, Sheila beside me, goes on. They used to bring me up here when I was about eight or nine. We'd go sledding, just pull over by the side of the road where there was a good hill or a ravine and take off. I have the best memories of this byway. That's why I decided to take it. I have some fine memories of my childhood, too of running away from my work as a servant to dance a reel in the music hall with the bearded lumberjacks, of climbing up a sandy slope to meet secretly with the boy who loved me, of laughing with my best friend, a housemaid like me, as we sloshed each other with soap and scrubbed wooden floors together. When you die and become a ghost, you remember everything from before your death and after too. And so I remember the lighthouse I climbed and slipping and clinging to the edge of it, and how you might fight and fight and fight as hard as you can to hang on and keep your head above the waves and still sink. And I remember rising from my watery grave and haunting the place that had killed me. Then the ghost hunter came, a man who said ghosts don't feel the way the living do, who said we were nothing but unthinking waves beating dull against a duller shore. But if that's the case, how did I manage to beat you, Mr. Pratt, for I have? For the time being, at least, though it's over my shoulder, I'm always looking now. I miss the old days, she lay saying sadly. My mom just passed away in summer, in June. I'm so sorry, I say, oh, knowing how hard the crossing can be. How did she die? 
emphysema. She smoked. It was hard at the end, but she did the right thing and let go. She followed the law. She didn't make any fuss. She died and she stayed dead the way you're supposed to. It's a strange will not to go where they tell you to go. What burns me up are the cheaters. Sheila lowers her voice and shakes her head. The lawbreakers. Everyone knows what the rules are now, right? When you go, you have to go. There's not enough room in this world for everyone and all their problems, not with everything this poor planet's already dealing with. So why do we still have some people staying when they shouldn't? I've heard there's even some kind of new thing running around, some kind of freak that's part ghost and part body snatcher. Perhaps the ghost hunter has dared to tell the world about me then. If that's true, I must find a way to get off this road and quit. What I want to know, the voice beside me says, rising angrily, is if the cleaners have their weapons, then why aren't they using them? I'd be fired from my job, on the spot, if I didn't do it as fast as I'm supposed to do it. But they can just let any kind of ghoul run around now? Her voice cracks, her powdered, sagging face turning suddenly ugly. How about I just lie down, do nothing, take this little vacation and never come back? I could make that happen, I think. My own anger rising. They always disappoint you in the end, the seemingly kind ones. But then all at once, holding the wheel tightly, Sheila starts to cry. It's a soft sound and she's dropped her chin as though trying to hide it in the down of her coat. All pain is the same, all pain is the same, I try telling myself, but my rage, it still blights and burns. I'm no ghoul, she called me, I never was. It's just that when you're dead, you can suffer from the same bleak moods as when you're alive. In the darkness, it can come so fast and easy. It shocks you. Then the spirit has to decide what to do with it. Give her a chance, I decide. Give her a test, the one that the last driver failed. I'd like to get out now, I say, before it gets too dark. No, what you ought to do is come all the way with me to Reno. She swipes at her tears, ordering me. Traveling alone like you are, like, like this, what you're doing, hitchhiking, it's, it's not legal and it's not safe, not with the way the world is. I know, but I'll still get out at the next town, please. Fine, well, fine, then whatever, she sputters. There's a turn off to a little place just ahead. White Bar, the town's called. It's not right on the road. You'll have to walk a ways over a bridge. It's out of the way, not nearly enough action for me, no craps or slots. Good, you can just let me off there. She stops the car on the shadowy verge of a lane and watches me as I get out and peer down toward the thickening woods. Guess you'll be all right. She leans from her seat toward me. Her headlights whirl through a flighty dust. Yes, you've done enough, Sheila. Now I think of a test. One question though. You are right that I'm traveling alone and it's not safe, but it's safer than the place I left at the coast and the man I left there. If I tell you that I'm on the run from him and that no one knows where I am, no one in the world, and that I don't want anyone to know, what would you say to that? She looks at me, her mouth opening, taken aback, and then nods her head slowly. Oh, hon, no wonder you were so quiet, my God. I've been there too, with a guy. I never want to be there again. I'm sorry, I'm so, so sorry. I'm sorry I got all riled up in here for a minute and never even noticed that I won't say a single word. I promise you, I don't even remember your name, okay? I never saw you. Thank you, Sheila. You better go on now. Sure you won't stay with me? I'm sure now. You take care of yourself, Rose. I will, you too. I let her go. Pain is all the same. It can make you do things if you're not careful. I turn toward the lane, careful not to look back at her and change my mind. Forward, it's the only and trickiest way to live. What fascinates me about the connection between ghosts and empathy is how very fragile it is. I think um, we're always ready to be, we can't help it when we pick up a ghost story, we're always more ready to be afraid than to empathetically uh, imagine. And I think it's interesting, again, to think about what we're practicing when we read ghost stories and how the genre can be used to police boundaries or break through them. How it can be used to illuminate, for example, 
in the scene I just shared with you, natural alliances. Yeah. And that, um, that that is something frightening. But usually what natural alliances are frightening to toward is the status quo. In that chapter, we see that Emma and Sheila have things in common. They're both women. They're both working people. They both suffered, it seems, abuse and tragedy in their lives. They are natural allies, and yet they almost miss it through lack of empathy. They are so close, close enough to see each other, and yet they almost don't manage it. Food for thought there. Thanks so much for listening to this portion of our conversation together. And now we get to throw things open to the live Q&A. I'm really looking forward to seeing and hearing you.